Hi, so welcome to this uh, morning session. We have the third lecture by, lecture by Percy Dived. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me just give you a quick reminder what we've done so far. We uh, have uh, discussed the following, that a Riemann-Hilbert problem sigma v involves an oriented contour by convention plus side is on your left as you go along and v is a jump matrix which is a invertible matrix at each point of the con contour such that the matrix v and its in inverse are bounded over the whole con 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 contour the kind of contours we look at are going to be what we call composed contours or con composed curves, which are finite unions of arcs, in other words, homeomorphic images of the interval 0, 1. And they had additional properties. These, each arc was rectifiable or locally rectifiable. That enabled us to introduce on any contour sigma, we could introduce C contour h of z, say, to be the integral of h of s d bar s upon s minus z. And this is over the contour. d bar means ds over 2, two, two pi i. So because we have rectifiable con uh, contours, we have a measure on each of the arcs. We have a me measure theory we can integrate. And just with these assumptions, we know that we can introduce the operators uh, C plus minus, which are the boundary values as you approach the point Z from the plus side or the minus side. And that is equal to 1 half of H plus I over 2 times the Hilbert transform on H. And we always have that C plus minus C minus is the identity. And this is true for all LP, where P is bigger or equal to 1 and less than infinity. But if you want these operators C plus minus or H to be bounded in LP, now P will only run from bigger than 1 and le less than in, in infinity, you need another property which is called the, uh, uh, which is the property that uh, the C gamma, little, little call it C gamma, which is equal to the supremum over all Z belonging to the contour and all numbers are which are positive times the ball of radius r around z intersect with the contour divided by r. <laughs> this quantity is finite, so you take any ball around any point z, so you could take a point like this, you take a ball, and you intersect with the con contour, you compute its arc length, you divide it by r and the supremum over z and r, it should be fin uh, finite. Such a curve is called a Car Carlison curve. It's called the Car Carlison constant. This is finite if and only if uh, h or c plus minus belong to the bounded operators in LP. Also, whenever you have just this over here, these bound boundary values are non-tangential limits. Okay, so now we can begin speaking concretely about what we mean by a Riemann-Hilbert problem. And so we always have a composite curve of these kinds. I'm not going to say anything more, more about it. Now we say uh, a pair of LP Z functions F plus minus belongs to 
and this is just a notation, boundary, CLP, if and only if, F is equal to C plus minus of some H, where H belongs to LP. So that's a definition. So that means if we define F of Z to be CH at Z, for Z belonging to C take away the contour, this is called naturally the extension of F plus minus off the contour. So those are extension of F plus minus off. Uh, you notice that this H is necessarily unique because what we have to have, yeah, this is, so F plus minus, right, equals that. So if I have this pair here, it's given by C plus C minus, so because of the property that C plus minus C minus is the identity, I'll keep putting the pluses. Because of that, we see that H is just F plus minus F minus, so H is unique. Okay. Now I'm going to introduce two kinds of Riemann-Hilbert problems. And both are used for different purposes, but they are equivalent to, uh, to each other. So let me just give the following. So we fix P less than one, and less, bigger than one, less than infinity. And we're given sigma V and a given sigma V and a measurable function F, say, we say M plus minus belongs to F plus boundary C of LP. So this means if I take M plus minus minus F, it can be written as C plus minus of some function H, of some function H, solves the inhomogeneous Riemann-Hilbert problem of type 1 NLP. So it's inhomogeneous Riemann-Hilbert problem of type 1 NLP. If M plus equals M minus times V uh, on the contour. So the function has this property. If you take away this function f, which is a me measurable function, it's not in any LP space or anything, but just m plus minus minus f is equal to c plus minus of some function h. And it has this relation almost everywhere on the contour. OK. So we say, so given. some function now which belongs to LP of sigma, we say M plus minus, which belongs to the boundary and LP, solves the inhomogeneous Riemann-Hilbert problem of type two in LP. If M plus equals M minus times V plus F almost everywhere on C. So you have these two different things. Now you notice the big difference between them is that M plus minus is something which automatically has an analytic continuation above the uh, off sigma, and M plus minus might not, because you don't know anything about F. Now, these are useful in many different ways. OK. OK, now, at V equal V minus inverse V plus be any pointwise 
almost everywhere, factorization of V, V plus minus, V plus minus inverse belongs to L infinity. Now, uh, this is just a pointwise factorization. There's no analyticity attached to it. Now, you should think about it in, in the following way. You should think of yourself in the con context of um, su pseudo differential operators, where you're obtaining an a priori picture of what V is going to look like which will then be useful for fur further analysis. So in other words, you have this freedom to factor it pointwise and achieve different goals in how, how you choose. All the results that we're going to be uh, speaking about are going to be independent of how you make this choice, and I'll make this clear. We write V plus equals identity plus W plus and V minus as being equal to uh, one identity minus W minus. So these are going to be bounded. Okay. And we introduce the following operator, CW. We let W be the pair W plus W minus. CWH is just C plus H of W minus plus C minus H of W plus. And this belongs to the bounded operators in LP. Okay, you've got a matrix valued function. Everything is of size K, K by K. You take your function H, you multiply it from the left onto W minus, then you take C plus of that. C plus, of course, is applied when I write C of H. I mean, if H is a vector, if H is a matrix, then you just mean C acting on H I J each component. And you do the same thing here. Now, because this is bounded, W minus is bounded, W plus is bounded, and C plus and C minus are bounded. This makes for a bounded operator. And as I said right in the very beginning, that as an analytical problem, a Riemann-Hilbert problem, is all about solving singular integral equations on the contour. So we're getting closer to that point. OK. Now, I just want to draw a little important diagram. Now these are going to be equivalent, and you use one equation or the one point of view or the other depending on what you want to achieve. And this is going to be connected with trying to solve this equation. This on the other hand is going to be useful for deformation theory. See. Over here, m plus and minus always have automatic analytical con continuations. So depending on what you want to do, you use one version of Riemann-Hilbert theory or the, or the other. So here is a theorem. Here's a theorem. So suppose uh, f times v minus 1 belongs to LP, and P is less than 1 and bigger than infinity. Then m plus, m plus plus f. solves the inhomogeneous Riemann-Hilbert problem of type um, uh, K 
OK. Uh, uh, of type 1, if m, uh, let me put it like this. OK. All right, so m plus minus, let me put it like that. OK, am I saying this correctly? Yeah. Yeah. OK. If m plus minus solves the inner genius riemann hilbert problem of type 2 in LP with f equals f times v minus the identity. Conversely, uh, if f belongs to L2, f belongs to LP, then m plus equals m plus plus f, and m minus equals m minus solves in homogeneous Riemann-Hilbert problem of type 2p if this object here solves um, the inhomogeneous Riemann-Hilbert problem of type 1 in LP with f equal to c minus of f. So the first part is really very, very trivial. The thing I want you to pick up from this is the obvious point. If you solve the one Riemann-Hilbert problem, you solve the other, and vice versa. I'm going to leave this proof as a, the full, full proof as, as an exercise, but the, fir the first part is really very trivial. Is, is, uh, <coughs> so if m plus minus belongs to LP uh, and m plus uh, equals m minus v plus f, where f is equal to f times v minus 1. Then this is m minus v plus f v minus 1. So that means m plus plus f equals m minus plus f v. So if you define this to be little m plus, and this here to be little m minus, you've got m plus equals m minus times v and m plus minus minus f belongs to the boundary. So that's a triviality. To go the other way around is, strange enough, a little bit more subtle, because you can't, in general, reverse this to go, if I know little f, I know capital F. But if I know capital F, I don't know little f, which this might not be in invertible. So I'll leave it for you to just check that through. Now. Okay. All right. Now the connection to a normalized Riemann-Hilbert problem is simply the following. We say uh, m plus minus solves the normalized Riemann Hilbert problem sigma v if it solves the inhomogeneous Riemann Hilbert problem of type 1 in P with f just to be the identity function. So, in other words, I'm saying that m plus equals m minus times v, and m plus equals the identity, plus minus plus uh, boundary. You notice that with this definition, you obviously see that if you take the extension now of, you define mz 
to be 1 plus c. So this means it's equal to uh, identity plus uh, c plus mass of some h. So you just define it to be this. Then this function here solves what we called formally a Riemann-Hilbert problem. It satisfies this jump condition. It goes to the identity as uh, z goes to infinity uh, in a trivial way. So this is the precise meaning of what we define to be for, for, formally a solution of the Riemann-Hilbert problem. All right. Now, where does this operator come into the picture? There's a very nice and cute calculation. So let f belong to Lp and m plus minus equals f plus c plus minus h and m plus equals m minus times b. In other words, m plus minus solves the inhomogeneous Riemann Hilbert of type 1 with this function f. So we've got m plus equals m minus times v minus inverse times v plus for any factorization, pointwise almost everywhere factorization. We define mu to be m plus times v plus inverse, which is also equal to m minus times v minus inverse. This is bounded. And now we make this definition. H of z, by definition, is just c of mu w plus plus w minus. So mu is a matrix valued function. On the condo, you multiply on the right by this, and you take the Cauchy transform of this object. Now, here comes perhaps the main calculation of the whole theory. Very simple, but extremely important. If I look now at H plus, that's going to be C plus of mu W plus plus mu W minus. And that's equal to C plus mu W plus plus C plus mu W minus. And now we use the fact that C plus minus C minus is the identity. So that means that H plus now is going to be C plus mu W minus plus C minus mu W plus plus mu W plus using C plus equals C minus times that this object. Now this object is what we call CW mu. And then we've got here plus mu W plus. That's CW minus the identity mu plus the identity plus W plus mu which is C mu minus 1, mu plus V plus mu. Okay. And we've got, uh, sorry, mu, I'm putting it on the wrong side, mu V mu. Now, this is what we the CW minus 1 mu. And this is what we call, this is how we defined mu, it's equal to m plus. So we've got this. Simple cal cal calculation, but that's what we get. And we get similarly, H minus is going to be CW minus 1 mu plus m minus. 
minus x prime. So we get that. So that means if we look at this combination here, m plus minus 1 minus f minus h plus minus, that's equal to 1 minus cw mu minus f. So the minus f I've added to both sides, and I've just put the, I've taken this, put it on this side, put the 1 minus c minus on the other side, I've got this identity. Now, by assumption, this object here belongs to the boundary of C in LP. And the same thing is true for that. So that means that the whole left-hand side belongs to this quantity here. So that means that we have that M plus minus minus F minus H plus minus is equal to C plus minus of some function H. But by this relationship, this is independent on the right-hand side of plus or minus. So that means that C plus H is equal to C minus H. But we know that C plus H minus C minus H is just H. So it must be that H is 0, which means that the left-hand side there is 0, which implies that 1 minus C W mu equals F. So there you have the fundamental connection between the Riemann-Hilbert problem and a particular sin singular integral operator equation on the contour. This is the fundamental connection. Okay, keep losing this. Now, conversely, so let me just summarize quickly. We've shown that an inhomogeneous Riemann Hilbert problem of type 1 is equivalent to knowing how to solve that of type 2. Now we begin to make the connection to this operator 1 minus C, CW. And we see that if we can solve the inhomogeneous Riemann Hilbert problem of type 1, we can solve equations of the form 1 minus CW mu f. Now the converse is true, that if 1 minus CW mu equals F for some mu belonging to LP, and F is given, then if we define H by C mu W plus plus W minus, if, then if we make this definition, we have that H plus minus equals F minus F plus mu V plus minus. Sorry, you, I'm not what is mu? mu is, here mu is the solution of this equation. And before, before we define mu over there. over there. So if I solve the inhomogeneous Riemann-Hilbert problem of type 1, and I define mu in this way, then that mu is going to solve this equation. I solve an inhomogeneous problem of type 1 or 2, and I get a solution of that equation. Now, if I have a solution of that equation, I obtain, I reverse this little cal calculation here, and I see that this function here, h, has these properties. And if we now set m plus minus, to be mu v plus minus, we see that m plus equals m minus times v by the definition of these things. And from here, we see that m plus minus is equal to 
f plus uh, the boundary operator, or c plus minus, of some function h. So if we solve this problem, we see we obtain a solution of the inhomogeneous Riemann Hilbert type 1. Now, uh, so uh, not only are these true algebraically, but they're also true an analytically. So you see, I'm not going to write this fact out, it's obvious, that if we solve this problem here, and we obtain a solution here, where we've got a bound on m plus minus in terms of the norm of f. Okay, so let me just write, write this out. Okay. okay. So, uh, let me call it a theorem. Let F belong to P of sigma. Let m plus minus solve problem of type 1 with p, f given. m plus minus solve 2p with f given by f times b minus the identity. Then 1 minus cw inverse on f is bound by c times m plus minus p. 1 minus cw inverse on f is bounded by some other constant plus minus plus f. Such a relationship follows very easily from the algebraic facts because mu is expressed in terms of m plus minus. So all of this, we're dealing with three equivalences. If you can solve type 1 or type 2, or you can invert the operator 1, 1 minus c, if any one of those three, three things is known, the other two immediately follow. They're equivalent. Now, what you see here is they're not only algebraic facts, but you have these analytical facts, which follow directly from the algebra. And if I would know, for example, that the solution of the type 1 pro pro problem was bounded in the natural sense, for example, of m plus minus, and Lp is bounded by some constant times norm f, similar thing to that, I would know immediately from here that I have an a priori bound. <laughs> 